Okay, guys, let's get to it. Matthew 12, verses 22 through 32 today. We're going to go ahead and read it. Um, but I want to talk to you about logical reasoning. Logical reasoning is a process of using rational, systematic steps based on truthful statements to arrive at a conclusion. Rational, logical reasoning is a process of using rational, systematic steps that are based in truth. Each of the systematic steps are based in truth with the purpose of arriving at a conclusion. Logically reasoning through these steps, which are based in truth, to arrive at a conclusion. Okay? Everybody get that? I'll, I'll give you an example. I walk into my house, my living room, and I find my living room covered in baby powder. Okay? There are three human beings in my house. Myself, my son Jack, and my son Luke. So the, the, law, the conclusion that I'm after is who did it? Who done it, right? I know I didn't do it. Logical reasoning, truthful statement number one, I didn't do it. That's one less person I have to worry about trying to figure out who did it. Amen? I walk in to find Jack and Luke. Logical reasoning or a systematic series of steps based on truthful statements. The next truthful statement is Luke does not have one ounce of baby powder on him. Jack, however, is covered in baby powder. Oh, man. Systematic truths. I didn't do it. Luke's not covered in it. Jack is covered in it. The conclusion then, of course, is Jack gets a spanking. Because he's the one who did it. See, the process that we just walked through to determine the conclusion, to, to arrive at our conclusion. Everybody got that? That is exactly what Christ does in these verses today. Systematic steps that are rooted in truth, that are bringing us along to a conclusion. The ultimate conclusion that he is arguing, maybe that's a bad word, arguing, um, that he is bringing his audience to, is that he is God. Okay? The ultimate conclusion that he is arriving at, he's trying to bring these folks along, is that he is in fact God. Amen? All right, let's read it. 22 through uh, 30 32. Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods? Unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven, and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Again, we find in these verses um, Jesus performing a radical miracle. And then we see the Pharisees coming at him with a ridiculous accusation. And now we see, and then we'll see in 25 through 32, his systematic, rational response. Okay? To arrive at the conclusion that what? He's God. Amen? Let's look at the miracle first. 
22 and 23. Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? So in this one miracle, Jesus shows his power over the physical and the spiritual, right? Because he healed them of the demon, spiritual. And what else did he do? Blind and mute. He's probably deaf also. Healed him. Shows his power over both the physical realm and healing him of his blindness and his muteness and deafness. But then also in the, 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 the spiritual, healing him of a demon. This man had several issues. Everybody saw them. It was abundantly clear this guy had issues. Jesus healed this dude in front of everybody. There could be no question as to the reality of what just happened. They saw it. He was, uh, was demon-possessed, blind and mute. Jesus then healed him, and he was not demon-possessed nor blind, mute, or deaf, right? It was clear. They couldn't deny the fact that it happened. Amen? Amen? So we have two groups at play here. We have the crowds, right? We see um, uh, verse 23. And all the people were amazed. Okay, oh, we have all the people. That's one group. And then we have the Pharisees. That's another group. Both groups could not deny what just happened. They saw it with their, only, own, the, with their eyes. Now they had to justify it. They had to figure out how that had happened. They had to make sense of it. The crowds, what do they say? They were amazed, right? That word, all, and all the people were amazed. That word amazed, is, it comes from the Greek word existemi, and it means to be totally astounded, to be knocked out of your senses, or f to use today's language, to have your mind blown. Oh my gosh! No way! Flipping out, losing their noodle. But they got to process it. They have to figure out, well, how, how, make sense of it. How is this possible? So what does the crowds say? The people. Remember two groups. Crowds, Pharisees. What do the crowds say? Can this be the son of David? Can this really be who's the son of David? It's the Messiah. It's the one the Old Testament speaks to. That he will come, the son of David. The Old Testament speaks of, and one title for the Messiah, who is Jesus, is the son of David. So they're saying, oh my, could this be the son of David? So they knew of the son of David. They knew that the Messiah would be coming. And one title is the son of David. He is the son of David. And so they're, could this be the son of David? They knew that the son of David, in the Old Testament, the son of David would do signs like this, miracles like this, to give evidence that he is in fact the son of David. Could this be the son of David? That's the crowds. That's the people, right? The second group, trying to process this and how it was possible, were the religious elite Pharisees. Keep in mind, they just heard the crowd say, could this be the son of David? But now we see the Pharisees, their ridiculous accusation in 24. Look at 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. The fact that the crowds were seriously considering Jesus that could be the son of David, the Messiah, drove the Pharisees into a panic. Because remember, Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees because they're teaching lies. They're all about world religion, man-made traditions, man laws. Nothing to do with God. Adding stuff to God's word. So Jesus has been rebuking them, rebuking them, rebuking them. Right? So now they see the crowd saying, considering the fact that this could be the son of David, now they're panicked and freaked out. So how do they process it? How do they then think that it's possible? Well, you know that they're not going to attribute it to God. Because they've been rebuked by him in, in, in chapter 12, which we just finished. That's exactly what happened the entire chapter. Jesus is rebuking them. It is not man-made traditions, right? 
So then they only have two options, the Pharisees. Either he's doing this by the power of God, or he's doing this by the power of Satan. Right? They only have two options. And they have rejected option one. They will not accept the truth. They will not accept that it's God through, it's God doing this. It's Jesus is God. Performing these miracles, they won't. So they're only left with one option, right? They're only left with one option. Beelzebul. So they accuse him of this. How does Jesus respond? Rational, systematic series of steps based on truthful statements. Logically reasoning with them. The truth. Look at verses 25 through 32. His rational response. So the key to understanding this is to see Jesus as rationally walking them through truthful statement, truthful statement, truthful statement, conclusion. Okay? The simplicity of his argument is amazing. It is so beautiful, so patient, and it should have us saying, well, duh. It's so simple. It's so clear. Of course! 25. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. So outside of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Satan would be one of the most powerful, intelligent beings out there, right? Besides God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Satan is the most intelligent being in existence outside of that. But even he is not stupid enough to battle himself. That's the point that Jesus is making. His house would be divided against himself. If Satan's casting out Satan, it's stupid. He has an agenda. He, if he was casting out Satan, he would be attacking his own agenda and going backwards. That's the argument that Jesus is making. Everybody get that? So simple. It's almost like the US flying over to Germany to fight the Nazis. Upon arriving in Germany, they find the Nazis shooting themselves. It's irrational. That's the point that he's making. He's not casting them out. So then he, he, then he says, in, in, in verse 27, sons, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Sons doesn't mean biological son. It means pupil or disciple here. So a pupil or disciple of a Pharisee who have said that they cast out demons. So they, the sons, the disciples of the Pharisees here, claim that they cast out demons. Okay. Jesus is telling the Pharisees to let their sons be the judge. Okay, your sons say they cast out demons, your disciples and pupils. Ask them by what power they cast out their, the demons that they say that they cast out. Because even them, they're, even, they're going to say, well, of course, by God. Because it's irrational to think that Satan would cast out Satan. See the argument? It's irrational to think that. So Jesus is saying, let your sons be the judge. Let your, let your disciples tell you by how, by whom, demons are cast out. By God and God alone. Because it's irrational to think Satan will cast out Satan. So he flips it on them. Systematic step of truth to arrive them at a conclusion. But they reject it. They don't want anything to do with it. But Jesus in his grace offers another logical argument to prove his divinity and messiahship. He says, look at it this way in verse 28. Okay, so he throws that one out. Look at it this way. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons which it is, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. 
Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus is saying, Have I not demonstrated before you that my power and authority is greater than Satan? Because if it was not, I wouldn't be able to cast out Satan, his demons, right? There's only one who has more power and authority than Satan. Who is it? God. That's the point. Who is the... the uh, who is, so he says here, when you enter a strong man's house, who's the strong man here? Satan. If you went to the strong man's house, in order to steal and plunder his goods, what do you got to do first? You got to bind the strong man. And you got to be stronger than the strong man to bind the strong man. Jesus, stronger than the strong man, Satan, binds Satan and plunders his goods. What are his goods that Jesus is talking about? No. Me. You. Satan's goods, his belongings, are us. So he plunders his goods, Satan's good, by binding Satan and saving and rescuing us from that. Is that not just fantastic? Amen. That is beautiful. Plunder his goods. He leaves with Satan's property. Because we were Satan's, right? We were Satan's. I mean, we belong to Satan. We're, we're not little mini-Satans, but we were Satan's possession, right? You, me, other sinners who have been redeemed. Amen. Verse 30, Jesus tells the Pharisees directly, and now us, that there is no middle ground with him. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. If you are with then you gather. If you are against, you know you are against because you scatter. And so now we get to verse 31 and 32, the unforgivable sin. I think an effective strategy that Satan has, I think, used to cause people not to look, when, when, when people look at this section of Scripture, they immediately go to these verses, the unforgivable sin. They miss what just happened before it. Because when you, when you go to the scripture, when you go to this section and you read through it, then you always go to the unforgivable sin. And everybody really hammers home the unforgivable sin. But you can't miss what just happened before. I mean, Jesus just logically put forth truthful statements to use that to bring them to an ultimate conclusion that he is, in fact, God. Can't miss that. But 31 and 32 says, Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven, and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Few passages of Scripture have been misinterpreted, misunderstood more than these two verses. So let's, uh, let's take it, break it down. Sin here, therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy. Sin represents all immoral and ungodly thoughts and actions. Blasphemy represents a conscious rejection of God as well as speaking evil against Him and mocking Him. But Jesus is saying every sin and, and blasphemy will be forgiven of those, of those people that are in Christ, right? Confess, repent, and are, are, are saved by His grace. Okay? They will be forgiven. But there is an exception. Blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Attributing the Spirit's work to Beelzebul, Satan, and an ultimate rejection of him. An ultimate rejection of him. That's exactly what the, what the scribes are doing, the Pharisees are doing in the verses prior to this. They were given clear evidence with their eyes. The crowd said, can this be? They say, it can't be. Because he keeps rebuking me and telling me I'm wrong. I, I reject him ultimately and attribute His work, Spirit's work, to Satan. At a certain point, they made a conscious decision to reject Him. So there was nothing left. What else, what, I mean, what else could, I mean, God at a certain point goes, hand off, go your way. The Pharisees did not reject him due to a lack of evidence. They had more evidence. 
than we when it comes to seeing with their own eyes. They rejected him because their own deeds were evil. and They could not handle the intimidating reality of Jesus' righteousness. They weren't looking for truth. They were looking to justify their wickedness. They saw it. They knew it was real. But they couldn't accept it. They had to reject it. They could not attribute it to God because they hated Him. So, in these verses, we see the beauty of Jesus, even His most adamant enemies, logically showing them the truth of who He is, patiently showing Him the truth, systematically walking through them, walking them to the ultimate conclusion that He's God. Do with it what you choose, but He is who He says He is. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him. So that the man spoke and saw, and all the people were amazed, and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against himself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Let them be your judges. They're not going to say that Satan cast out the demons through them. Because only God would. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Real quick. Um, eisegesis versus exegesis. When you're looking at a text like this, what is the text doing? What is the text teaching? What is God teaching in the text? Let, that's exegeting the text, pulling it out. Eisegeting it is reading into it or having a message or what you want to say and adding into it, right? A good example of this... I, of eisegeting the text would be taking this portion of scripture and looking at verse 25 and speak having a message about unity we need to be together we cannot be divided we need to be together as a country we need to be together and unified because if we're not look at what 25 says Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. No city or house divided against itself will stand. So we need to be together. I'm giving you an example of a sermon that would look like one that is eisegeting the text, reading into it. I have a message that I want to preach unity, so I'm going to use this verse to preach unity. That's not what the message is saying. That's not what the, the, the text is saying. The text is saying that Jesus is God. Use the, allow the context to teach what it says. Don't pull out something to make it say what you want to say. Do you see my point? There's a lot of pulpits that that's how this verse, this section would have been handled. That's not what God's communicating in here. Sure, we need to be together. But... Go buy an Oprah Winfrey book and teach from that. That's not what this, that's not the point of this text. The point of this text is to show that Jesus is God. He alone has the power to cast out demons. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. Um, R.C. Sproul, Lord, we thank you for him. I pray for his family, his wife, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, 
Uh, Lord, we thank you for his faithfulness to you while he was on this planet and willing to teach truth no matter the cost. Thank you for that life and, and those like it who are willing to stand firm on the truth of text, even at the cost of uh, persecution. And So we thank you for that. Thank you for allowing us to see examples of what that looks like so that you use that to help encourage and empower us, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who revealed these truths to those who have uh, been saved, Lord. So we ask that you continue to use us for your glory so that we hear like R.C. has heard, well done, good and faithful servant. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.